Education Week continues on PBS Hawaii. Tonight, an unprecedented live conversation with the education leadership from Hawaii's public, private, and charter schools. Philip Bossard from Hawaii's Association of Independent Schools, Holoua Stender, Kamehameha Schools, Sione Thompson, the State Public Charter School Commission, and Phyllis Unebisami from Hawaii's DOE. Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of Insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Daryl Huff from Hawaii News Now. In his State of the State address this year, Governor Ige said, in order to transform our economy, we need to transform our schools so our children can meet the demands of jobs in a knowledge-based industry. He also stated that by 2020, just three years from now, 70% of all jobs in Hawaii will require some post-secondary education. A study from Georgetown's Public Policy Institute reached these conclusions. Job openings in healthcare, community services, and STEM will grow the fastest among occupational clusters. The foremost in-demand competencies in the job market will be judgment decision-making, communications, analysis, and administration. The demand for physical skills has continued to decline over time, except for near vision, which you need to read computer screens and documents. The United <laughs> States will have a shortage of five million workers with post-secondary education at the current production rate by 2020. With us tonight, we have leaders of our public, private, and charter school systems. We'll hear what they have to say about the governor's remarks and this direct link between our schools and transforming our economy and employment landscape. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Now to our guests. Phyllis Udibisami is the Deputy Superintendent, Hawaii Department of Education. Prior to this appointment, she was the Acting Assistant Superintendent for the Office of Strategy, Innovation, and Planning. And before rejoining the DOE, she was an independent educational consultant and managing director at Kamehameha Schools. Philip Bossert is the Acting Executive Director of the Hawaii Association for Independent Schools, Hawaii's private schools advocacy organization. He has an expert interest in schools of the future. Prior to 2008, he was the president of Hawaii Loa College. Holo Ua Stender is the executive vice Pre president of education at Kamehameha Schools, responsible for leading all Kamehameha Schools educational programs. His prior positions include head of school for KS Hawaii Island and principal at KS Kapalama Elementary School. And Sione Thompson is the executive director of the State Public Charter School Commission, a position to which he was appointed in September. Prior to that, he was the project director for the Title III at the University of Hawaii, West Oahu. He spent the 10 previous years at St. Louis School, his alma mater, where he was vice principal and later principal of the All Boys Catholic School. We've got two St. Louis alumni. That's right. right. Yeah. <laughs> so just to start off, and, um, Mr. Stender, what is it that connects schools to the economy. Why the statement that the governor made about having to transform schools to transform economy, that's not an automatic intuitive statement. I don't think people see the connection. I think that um, the transformative nature of our economy and where we're going with um, education is absolutely related. I think the governor is absolutely right to, to think about how we can pr provide those conditions in all of our schools, whether they be private, public, or charter, uh, to provide those conditions that are innovative places and passion-filled places for our students so that they'll thrive in, um, in this uh, contemporary world because the way that we've been doing education for so long needs a major transformation to prepare our students for the future. What kind of transformation are we talking about, uh, Phil Bosser? So I think there's sort of two sides of uh, what you just said is one, preparing for jobs that we don't know what those jobs are and so how do you train people for that? It's not like becoming an accountant. But also you want to train up a certain number of people to start new companies and create new jobs. And so that takes a lot of um, things that you don't learn by taking standardized tests and, and reading textbooks, it's mm -hmm. more on the creative side of things. And so you want people who are going to help create that future economy, I think. 
Uh, Phyllis and Ibisami from <coughs> Disney. So where, um, there's already been lots of transformation within the schools, right? Yes. The people think, I mean, like we were talking about earlier, that when I take my experience as a student and I try and help my kids, yes. it's like it's not even close. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, are we still stuck in some old-fashioned ways, or have we moved way past the assumption that schools lead to jobs? Um, I think that it's it's not just a one track from school to job, but it's also school to aspirations around um, careers um, or um, post-secondary types of um, uh, learning that takes you into uh, more professional jobs. So, I, you know, when we take a look at an individual student, can we go from an industry model of we're all going to be plantation workers or we're all going to be um, tied to the community that we're in? Um, how do we um, expand the aspirations of our students to take a look at international and global um, opportunities that might be available to them? And how do we then bring that back to our, our island home? You know, Sione Thompson from the charter schools, I mean, charter schools are known for innovation. Is, is this a major motivation behind the charter school movement, is to provide this kind of unique experiences and, and new ideas to kids? I absolutely agree with the, my colleagues and also with what the governor had to say is that this, you know, space for innovation mm -hmm. really brings um, a new light to opportunities you know, obviously new ways of educating our mm -hmm. students and new ways of looking at the, the, the future, but new ways of transforming our educational system and meeting our students of where they're at and getting them to where we think they need to be with guessing what type of workforce is really gonna be mm -hmm. ahead of them in the future. You know, um, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. the charter schools, you know, there's a, there's a whole diversity of them. You know, yeah. we hear a lot about the native Hawaiian language, the immersion schools and so, but there's a multiplicity of other ones. In the experience of the charter school, have they found that um, kids really respond to completely different ways of, of school, that the old school models just aren't working for a lot of kids? Well, first of all, you're absolutely right. If you've seen one charter school, you've seen one charter school. <laughs> They're all very different and unique in their own ways. Um, and there's some amazing models. They, they, they've, they've adopted some of the most amazing innovative practices today, and then they've made it really INA-based and, and culture-based. Mm -hmm. And you see, you see uh, very invigorating educators that are engaging students in a much different way. Now, what we've tried to do as an authorizer, as the only authorizer in the state, is allow a platform for exactly that. Innovation equals this research and development. And we hope that this research and development will inform the greater education system of Hawaii of what works and what doesn't work. And as I visit schools and as I walk, there is a lot of great things that work, that just get it. And it's not seeing through standardized tasks. Right. I mean, we see, we see this uh, great with heart, breath, mm -hmm. uh, uh, measuring things like kuleana and aloha. We were talking about this earlier. I think that's leading in the nation. If we could see these emotional quotients and SQEQ, I yeah. think that's yeah. the wave of the future and, and will really lead to our next generation of inventors and entrepreneurs. And I think it's really about centering our learning on the passions of our students, on their aspiration. So student-centered learning is something really, really um, important for us to realize is that students will lead the way with the things that they need, they'll tell you what they need. So providing that environment for them to, to just excel and innovate, um, you know, whether it be computer science or Hawaiian language or um, performing arts or athletics, I mean, they're leading the way and they, um, are, they best learn when they're given those opportunities to choose their own subject, choose their own journey, and that really leads to happiness, I think and giving back to the community in great ways. Let me um, circle us back to the part of the premise of the first part of this show is the connection between the schools and learning and the economy. And we'll start with sort of a, a graphic that will show us where we are today in terms of Hawaii's economic outlook and the jobs that we have. We have a graphic that we can show you. This is from data supplied by the State Department of Business and the Census by industry sector. How do we categorize more than 600,000 jobs across our state? Now, federal, state, and local governments collectively are the largest employer, followed closely by jobs in the accommodations, food, and beverage sector, that's obviously tourism, 
together, that's 35% of the jobs in sectors that are not among those predicted to grow nationally. The Georgetown study mentioned healthcare and social services. We're at 11% of that. And it mentioned STEM, which would include professional and business services, 13% of local jobs there, as well as information technology, which is at 1%. So let me just throw this out. How much transformation of the schools do we have to do if that's what we have today and there's something going to be completely different coming right down the pipe tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Phyllis, it'll be so I, th I think going back to that graphic, um, when I take a look at it is um, what is our main industry and how have we diversified um, Hawaii's economic um, base, right? Um, when I look at some of the things like the healthcare, um, retail and um, uh, the food industry is, um, those are those are things that I think any community will have to have in order for it to be a strong and healthy community. And so those will always be present. The question is that as, as a state and a, as a um, collection of leaders, what do we believe it's gonna take for Hawaii to be a really strong state, right? And then we have to then decide how do we wanna diversify not only the industry, how do we strengthen our communities? And then what does that look like in the, our educational system? Because whatever is happening in the community, it flows into and it affects what's happening in our schools. Yeah, and I think also that if you just look at information technology, you're missing part of the point because mm -hmm. information technology is gonna transform all those sectors. Yes. Um, and if you look at what Uber did to tax Mm -hmm. business and what um, Amazon. Airbnb and, and <laughs> mm -hmm. Amazon and mm -hmm. all the rest um, mm -hmm. so all of those are going to be transformed by mm -hmm. biotech and infotech so you can't it's not that those need to go away but they're going to be totally different right. and uh, there was a, um, a presentation at a recent conference I was at and the woman who was presenting she said what does the sharing economy look like for education mm -hmm. Uh, so we we see Uber and we see Airbnb. What do schools look like in the sharing economy? I have no idea. I was going to say, what's the answer? <laughs> <laughs> she didn't have an idea either. And I think the you know the other things that we have to really pay attention to is uh, are things like um, um, character, integrity, um, those values and identity. Um, language, how we treat each other's people, what is the happiness quotient. I mean, those are really, really important for all of us to uh, think about and discover along with our student voices and with our teacher voices because that is the real way to sort of social self-sufficiency and, and happiness again. Now, as far as jobs are concerned, I mean, things are changing so quickly. As you said earlier, we don't know the different types of jobs that will our children will have to um, apply for or be ready for in five, 10, 20 years. And so we need to let them lead us on that journey along with our teachers and you know, the, the performance of our students, their ability to collaborate, to be globally competent, to, you know, all of our um, outcomes for our students have to be at a different level now. Mm -hmm. And the transforming of our economy, uh, Phyllis is absolutely right, there's gonna be some things that, you know, service industry jobs that will not go away, but it will also not propel the high levels that we need to propel here in Hawaii and and uh, for our for our keiki so that they can come home because many of them I mean we were talking earlier that our economy is not such that they can come home and really um, propel themselves within our current system you know I want to uh, respect our viewers questions and this is a very interesting one because it brings back kind of an old word in schools curriculum mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what does the panel think the role of computer science and computational thinking have in the K through 12 curriculum? Let me try you first on that. I mean, is it, do you teach kids how to do computers so they can get jobs later or is it even more incorporated than that now? So let's be really clear that probably the most savvy person in, of te um, technology in the classroom is probably the student, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. at, in your home, right? who's asking who how to use the, the technology, yeah. right? right? 
So when we, when we use that term computer science, um, I think we've moved past just computer science mm -hmm. to um, really technology and what's the use of technology and um, what's the new industry might be um, creating new ways to mm -hmm. use technology, not necessarily being a user of technology, but being someone who creates the you technology. You know, one thing that, that makes me think of is, you know, uh, when kids who are my kids' ages, which is the mm -hmm. late teens, early 20s, when they were started in school, mm -hmm. All devices are off. You don't, you know, you basically don't, don't bring a cell phone. Yeah. If you gave your kid a cell phone when they were five or six, everybody thought you were a horrible parent. Right, right. And so now it seems like it's a natural part. Is that something that in the private schools, for example, that it's it's not so much you can't use those devices, but let's incorporate that into what's going right. on. Right, and whether it's one to one, and the school provides it, or what they call bring your own technology, and allow the students to use what they're most comfortable with. And I think it gets hard if you're doing that and everybody has that capacity to, the teacher says, well, in 1872, this happened, and the students all look it up mm -hmm. and say, no, that mm -hmm. didn't happen. <laughs> um, so you, it has to go towards project-based learning, and it has to go towards, as you said, more student-centered learning, um, because they've got that. And the teacher becomes the coach. The mm -hmm. teacher becomes the facilitator. Mm -hmm. And the students are still going to get stuck and wonder where stuff is. And it's a much better role, I think. You know, I'm curious, uh, Sione Thompson from the charter schools, give me some ideas of how some <coughs> charter schools are approaching this, the technology issue. I know some of them are literally technology-based schools with very few classrooms and a lot of kids out at home working on their computers, right? Sure, absolutely. There's a many different blended programs, online programs, and each one is unique in of itself. And, and like Phyllis said, the, the, these digital natives, they're, mm -hmm. the, they're the ones that are driving curriculum almost mm -hmm. and, and, and sharing. And there's this, there's this idea, uh, um, zone of proximal development, where students are learning mm -hmm. at, the, at the appropriate time, at the appropriate space through online learning and through, and they're going through curriculum so fast, yeah. and so quickly, mm -hmm. we're catching up and having to create new spaces, mm -hmm. right. develop new ideas, and allow, and sometimes the best way to teach is get out of the way. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and we've seen that, and we've seen some amazing things, yeah. I think that could be really powerful for the young person facing a completely unsteady and unpredictable world, right? Um, some really interesting questions coming in from our viewers. I'll just throw these out. Will teachers be replaced by artificial intelligence? <laughs> going right to the heart of your industry. Uh, what do you think is going to happen to teaching teachers as we move forward? You, you look like a scary question to you. Like, well, oh, yeah, my it, gosh. It, well, it's, um, I think teaching as a profession has to evolve. I, I don't think it's going to go away. I think um, our students absolutely need um, our most qualified, high-performing teachers in, in all aspects of their lives, and that include counts, uh, includes counselors, um, academic support services, um, social uh, well-being services. All of those things are really, really important. But how we coach students now is going to be really different because, again, talking about artificial intelligence, I mean, they're going, going to create that future. So how do we as teachers sort of support them in their endeavors to move toward future. And again, it's a, it's a scary world in a, in a sense because as, you know, us being teachers for years and years, mm -hmm. it's sort of we need to adapt. Otherwise, we might become um, um, dinosaurs yeah. within our profession. Or, as Sione says, in the way. I think um, exactly right. The, I mean, the teacher's role as instructional delivery could be done better with artificial intelligence, I think, but that's only a small part of what mm -hmm. most teachers do. Absolutely. And I think, as you pointed out, the role of coach, counselor, all those other things teachers do, that's never going to go away. So you're saying, Phyllis, you could respond to this, teachers aren't going to get Ubered. <laughs> no, you know, I, I think any more than artificial intelligence will take over parenting. 
right? That it doesn't, I mean, Hopefully there's times we, <laughs> we, we do use, um, we use technology to help us out, right? But the, the reality is um, in order for human beings to grow and, and be nurtured and, and be cared for, um, there needs to be a significant adult in their lives. Mm -hmm. and, and the more significant adults that are nurturing around a, a child, a single child, makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about, um, you know, the profession of education and educators, um, you know, a, a caring and um, a committed principal or, or teacher, um, instructor, or counselor, those, you can't replace that, you totally. know. Yeah. yeah, you know, every one of us, we've, we've been through mm -hmm. many years of education, and we can still point back to the people who made a difference mm -hmm. in our lives. Senator Thompson, you, you're, you're looking very pleased. <laughs> <laughs> Are you thinking of a teacher who has helped you or your children? I absolutely think that there's just some basic foundational social skills that this interaction, this mentorship, uh, mm -hmm. even when students are in an environment with other students, there's a, just a, a greater, more enriching environment. You know, we use these old cliches, it takes a village, but it truly does because you learn from everybody in different ways and so much different aspects. So I worry as a parent of, of, of four young ones when they're constantly in the screen and I'm limiting screen mm -hmm. time and I'm saying, don't forget to talk to your siblings. Don't forget to get out there and talk to your teacher. Talk and speak and ask yeah. questions and inquire. Um, and, and so I nod and I say, yeah, there's, there's something genuine about the social interaction of people, it's mm -hmm. very, very different. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, um, one of the, again, premises we started this show with was this discussion about the need for post-secondary education, mm -hmm. you know, college, gotta go to college, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and in this economy, right, there's so many jobs that mm -hmm. don't involve, don't require post-secondary education. Do colleges have to start changing to, to make this transformation complete? And this whole thing about, I mean, how is the secondary, the, the college part of this piece going to change? I would think that it's the same thing. It's the adaptation to the new world. Because uh, colleges don't adapt quick. No, they don't, and, and neither do schools. I mean, so it's, it's incumbent upon all of us to work really, really hard to look at what students need again. And colleges are very, very important. And more important is the love of learning and the ability to be a lifelong learner on your own. So when, as you're teaching our, um, our children from the earliest ages, they have to have uh, wonderful environments and people who support them and love them and nurture them all the way through uh, to post-secondary success. Sorry to interrupt you, but do others think that the colleges have got to also transform? Yeah, and think, how do you think? Yeah. I, so I certainly think that, and I think we also need to understand that not everybody needs to go to college. I think respecting the fact that some people are, are just going to be brilliant repairers of those mm -hmm. flying cars and, and the people who are going to build these magnificent artificially intelligent homes for us, they're going to make a lot more money than a college educated <laughs> teacher. But should they go to college to get there too? It could be, yeah, that they're going to need those skills. So the notion of college or post-secondary education mm -hmm. needs to be very widely interpreted. Mm -hmm. You to say uh, what I was going to say is, well, I wish someone in college was on this panel to defend themselves because what I'm about to say may be a little offensive. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're watching. They're wa I'm sure they're watching. <laughs> but uh, I, I think colleges have gotten into the business of getting into business. And to get back to the basics of education and streamline the education, so many of our young people are walking away with this debt mm -hmm. that they cannot, they cannot mm -hmm. get out of. Mm -hmm. And that right. dampens the economy too. That dampens the economy mm -hmm. as well. So, you know, um, I see, I see a possibility and opportunity there for colleges and, and secondary ed and all trickle all the way down to preschool to work together to see what can we streamline to make sure that we are being effective and efficient and not putting our young into debt when they come out. And there's a lot more pre or uber pressure on colleges than there are on K-12. But let's also be clear though that it, when we say do colleges need to be transformed, the assumption that, that we, we that might come from that question is that they haven't transformed or they're not in the process of transforming. Mm -hmm. And I, I would suggest that because of the partnerships that we have mm -hmm. with the universities um, is that there is transformation mm -hmm. going on. Now most of that, most, most change um, starts, it's personal, right? It's really finding the right people to partner with first within an organization. It's true in the DOE, it's true anywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so I, I really look for who can we partner with that has the same aspirations and dreams for our kids and are willing to take discretionary energy and make um, be a part of like designing something that's going to make a difference. Yeah, I would absolutely right? agree with that yeah. because you know we're looking for college partners mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. with the University of yeah. Hawaii, with Chaminade University, HPU, um, Arizona State University, all of these places that are um, looking to be that uh, that pathway for our students. And we're and, finding them. And we're finding them. We're and finding we're finding them. that they're ready for transformation, if not teaching us a lot about transformation and what that what that pathway and what the journey is for our students toward And that's how you're getting success. the dual credit and you're getting like these opportunities where the, the colleges are, the universities are coming on our campuses and working with our You faculty. know, there are some naysayers on that issue and that brings us to the mm -hmm. next clip that we'd like to show you last mm -hmm. night on the critically acclaimed documentary on education that was called Most Likely to Succeed. Mm -hmm. It was rebroadcast here on PBS Hawaii and we have a clip that raises the question of whether the value of today's college degree will be relevant in the technology-driven future that lies ahead. Take a look. The idea of enduring the drudgery of standardized tests, traditional homework, lectures, will build the kind of character in them that will one day lead to a happier life may no longer be true. Consider this economist out of MIT who argues that kids who will go on to do well in school and graduate from college won't necessarily be able to find a job. Most parents today grew up in a world which saw the U.S. economy grow and median income grow with it. And that's always been true until here. Curiously, around the late 90s, the economy had grown, but middle class income had not. In essence, the U.S. economy is now able to produce more wealth while hiring fewer and fewer people. And this is troubling, particularly for college graduates. In addition to being saddled with record levels of debt, 53% of all recent college graduates either can't find a job or are working at a job they could have just as easily have found if they'd skipped school altogether. This is a jobs report that appeared on the Forbes website. It's just kind of a vanilla looking report about corporate earnings. The only thing interesting about it to me is that it was generated entirely by an algorithm. There was no human being involved in producing this or writing it or editing it. The company is called Narrative Science and what they do is take a body of facts, in other words, all the details of corporate earnings, and they write a prose narrative about it. And if you read these, they are perfectly clean, clear, English prose. Now, only a few years ago, we couldn't do this. If you wanted to have something written, you had to involve a human being in that work. And the consequence that I spend a lot of time thinking about is what are people going to do for a living when their muscle power really isn't valued anymore because we have all kinds of muscle accelerators. And then their mental power is not as valued anymore because we have these astonishing digital technologies that can do mental things, cognitive things, that we used to previously require people to do. The economy that we created over the course of the 20th century was an economy that needed a large number of moderately skilled people who could do the three R's and who could follow pretty simple instructions. As we head deeper into the 21st century, I really don't think that's the case anymore, yet our educational system still seems to be focused on turning out people with that same relatively small set of skills. My fear is that they're heading into a society and an economy and a workforce that doesn't value those skills very much anymore. And I think we need to take a good hard look and figure out what kinds of people, what kinds of skills are demanded in the technologically extraordinary society and economy that we're creating. Okay, so uh, anybody want to, anybody provoked a thought by that? Well, I've seen the film like 50 times now, <laughs> and uh, it's, um, so, and everything that they're saying there, I think, is already the case, mm -hmm. um, and behind all those things that are happening, that are jobs that are getting replaced, are this burgeoning new jobs that are writing those programs, that are creating the biotech and the infotech and the, the nanotech and all of that. <clears throat> so they're only focusing on, well, they're focusing on the fact 
that it's a whole new world in terms of what you study to do. Mm -hmm. And most of those are way more complex than what most colleges teach now. And I think uh, a lot of kids are going to say, I'm just going to graduate high school and go straight to work for Microsoft and, mm -hmm. and do that instead of spending four years. So I think, I think they're right, but they're also not telling the whole story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the urgency for transformation. I think that, you know, we don't have a lot of time. We were talking um, earlier that 2020 is upon us. And um, so there's that urgency to transform our schools to make sure that students have worthwhile, um, uh, wonderful conditions. You know, in Hawaiian, there's a saying, mohala i kawaii kamaka o kapua, which means um, when the conditions are right, the flowers will thrive. So how do we provide these right conditions mm -hmm. for our uh, children, our flowers, to really thrive in this um, changing world of artificial intelligence and coding and, and technology and computer science? I mean, um, I saw a presentation on Maui today when um, um, uh, Kavehi, one of our um, leading uh, Maui technologists, uh, was a leader of um, providing coding, building robots, um, teaching younger people how to do it at, at the, the Maui campus. And it was just incredible. You the know, there's an interesting question here uh, from a viewer that I think is kind of provocative and goes to the transformation necessary in the, you know, pre second basically K-12, right? Will it still take 16 years, including college, to educate a person with this new innovation you're speaking of? Interesting thought. I mean, really, I mean, like you're saying, they might, what do you guys yeah, think about that yeah. concept? I mean, how different does school look if all of a sudden there's not a fixed graduation date? So Stanford University just finished this uh, plan for Stanford 2025, and they said maybe we should get rid of Stanford alumni. In the future, there will only be Stanford students. Mm. You'll, so there's no end to student because, learning. Yeah, so maybe when you're a mm -hmm. freshman at Stanford, mm -hmm you only take two or three courses and then you take a year off and then, but throughout your whole life, you'll be a Stanford student. So it won't take 16 years, it'll take But you need a diploma years. to pay off the debt from Stanford. <laughs> That's probably true. <laughs> but so more thoughts about the transformative concept. I mean, what do you think? Is, do you see a time when it's all basically you just get to a certain place, then you move to the next place? I think that that's probably what the future will hold. I mean, people will probably take um, sabbaticals from school to go into the workforce, come back to school. It's constantly about learning and adapting because even though you might get a job, say, in your 20s, the uh, amount of it adaptive, adaptivity has to um, move with the workforce, with the needs of um, artificial intelligence nowadays and all the new types of technology. So I think um, schooling is a lifelong learning uh, process that we all have to um, indulge in and, and be a part of. I think the opportunity here too is that collaboration between industry and school. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, I think over time we'll see that it will merge and it will look more of the same. You'll see those who are in career paths or in a mm -hmm. career they will continue to professionally develop and educate their workforce right. to evolve. And those who are not quite ready to make that decision and jump into the workforce who are in college and secondary ed will partner with industry to see how industry affects my, <laughs> my thinking and my pathway and let me continue this, this uh, endeavor of trying to figure it out. So I think we'll, it'll, it'll bridge and we'll see industry look more like schools and schools look more mm -hmm. like industries and they'll, <laughs> they'll be blended. And I think our teachers too, our teachers realize that, so they're preparing themselves. And you know, when you look at teacher development now, they're preparing themselves for this brand new future and transforming themselves and constantly um, professionally developing their skills and their outlook and, and the ways that they counsel and work with children. You know, one of the, the producer of that documentary um, named Ted, Ted Dintersmith mm -hmm. um, throws out the question, how can public charter and private schools work together to ensure great future for kids all across our islands? And a, a question from a viewer in the same light. In the past, there have been such polarizing opinions and relationships, I would say, between public and private advocates and schools. Does tonight represent a new partnership between public, private, and charter schools, since we're all in it for the same reason, Hawaii's keiki? Uh, are we getting to a point where these are not siloed, where you, 
you go to Punahou Kamehameha as a kindergartner and you graduate at the end? Or, you know, is the movement between schools, the different strengths of different, I mean, is, are we heading toward a place like that too? I think we've, we've gotten there. Um, they, you know, right before the, um, the show, Sioni and I were talking about some joint efforts around um, school visitations and um, how to support each other and making sure that all, all of our children, all of the learners are getting a great education and how do we support each other in that work. We've worked together mm -hmm. um, in the same effort and um, the department has um, enjoyed partnerships with all of these um, different entities for a number of years. Um, what might not be um, available or un known by the public is that this has been going on even before we've started our, our particular jobs. Well, I kind of warned you about this question in advance, <laughs> talking about everybody getting along so well. Yeah. You know, the perception is that the charter schools are fighting for every penny from mm -hmm. DOE, mm -hmm. and that you know, they're not getting the respect that they deserve. Mm -hmm. DOE certainly doesn't get the respect mm -hmm. that it deserves as an organization in this. Mm -hmm. And then uh, private schools are have a business model that pretty much needs to hold that person, because that's where the money is, is from, yeah. you know, and Kamehameha Schools is serving its, its cohort, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, can we really expect, are, are you really seeing a time when you, you guys will break down those walls in the course of a particular student's progress, as opposed to, I've got this group of students and this group of students. Can we mix the school students I think together? it's absolutely imperative that we work harder toward building these networks, and so we have built networks with our um, charter schools, with our DOE schools, with our universities, and the, the opportunities that we have to partner have to be and work with the legislature and um, and philanthropists mm -hmm. to propel the um, education here in Hawaii for the pono of all of our keiki. It's going to be really important that we work harder to network, to build culturally relevant uh, assessments, project-based assessments, item-based assessments. Talk about you know our Eola Foundation of Hawaiian identity and Hawaiian culture. Those are really foundational for our state and it propels everything that we do. We talked about character um, integrity. Those are the things that we really need to work together to make sure that in the journey of all of our children that they have opportunities to have these high level um, instructional um, um, coaches and teachers and counselors and it's, um, and I know we're working together. We have Kanai Okana, um, our, and building those things with our private um, partners and our university partners. So I'm going to bring another voice in really quickly, someone you know very well. Recently, PBS Hawaii CEO Leslie Wilcox spoke with Kamehameha School CEO Livingston Jack Wong for an episode of Long Story Short that will air this coming Tuesday. Here's what Mr. Wong had to say about educational partnering. Because um, the princess left such a large legacy to um, to Kamehameha. Uh, I know people are always saying, well, let Kamehameha do it. They got all the money. Um, is that true? You know, I mean, should, should you be doing more? What's interesting, what we're really learning on our strategic planning process is, you know, our vision is really to have every Native Hawaiian succeeding in education. And um, every Native Hawaiian. Every Native Hawaiian to succeed in education. And by every Native Hawaiian, we also mean every child in the state should be succeeding in education. Um, but this is not something even we can do alone. And um, the realization that you have a long-term vision that you can't do alone um, really requires you to re-examine how you approach um, your strategies. And for us, it's, it's about partnering. It's about working with other organizations that are already doing great work and really supporting them and learning how to support from the back as well as the front. And a lot of times you want to be out front, but it's just as important for us to lead from the back, to be able to say, um, how do we support those organizations doing great work how do we help those schools that are already doing wonderful things in Native Hawaiian education? And how do we be a part of that and uh, play a small role just to feel good about supporting them? Managing partnerships is difficult. I mean, as we see in marriage, um, it must, is, has it been difficult to find good partners or, or are there, you know, how do you pick a partner? So I think, you know, there's so many people doing wonderful work in education that I don't, we've not had any problem at all finding great partners mm -hmm. doing great work. I think, you know, my question is how do we support them best mm -hmm. and how do we make sure they succeed? 
And um, I think that's always a great conversation to have, but it also is, you know, everything we do, whether it's partnerships or by ourselves, is always about choices, right? Because there's so many great things we can do. How do we choose as a community what's the right path for education? And that's not something we can do alone. You know, we uh, got a question from a viewer uh, in advance of the show. In what ways should every school in Hawaii be the same? In what ways should they be different? Mm. Shona Thompson is with a, yeah. a whole bunch <laughs> of different schools. Sure. <laughs> I mean, what do you, how important is it for schools to be different from each other, or should they be all aligned? I mean, that's it's always been a big right. issue. Standardization and versus innovation and independence. One thing that should be constant is that we're here for the betterment of our keiki, and we all expect high expectations we all expect high quality out of right. out of everything that we do <clears throat> that's the, that's the constant uh, other than that I think everything should really be independent to the needs of the community the needs of the child uh, and if every community looks different we should be able to adapt standards standards are the base and then we move mm -hmm. from there mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I think that's exactly right I mean, we've got 96 member schools and Every one of them is different. Mm -hmm. And some of them are as small as 30 students, and then Punahou's 10 times that. And, and so there's, and some of those schools are um, working. I mean, I'll just mention Punahou has the Pueo program that's mm -hmm. been for 10 or 12 years been working. And mm -hmm. Kamehameha is a private school that's supporting both the public schools and the charter schools. And so I, I totally agree with what. Um, I mean, you were explaining earlier that the networks are there mm -hmm. and have been. Could we do better? Obviously, we could all do better. So, you know, I've got a, a lot of questions <laughs> from viewers, and I want to go to a few of them. And this is very interesting because we're talking about a very sort of from very structured and step-by-step -step model that we we all grew up with, right? You get from one grade to the next grade. You take this test. You 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 you, you get this skill to a very you know personal driven model, right? So the question the viewer had was, can you give examples on why you have confidence that students know what is best for themselves in terms of their means, modes of education? You know, huh. that's an interesting question. It's a, it is. Um, so as a parent, um, you know, I, I, I think of my um, youngest and uh, when she was in a, a, a sophomore in high school, I remember her feeling this pressure to like, oh, I gotta know what I, what, what um, degree I wanna get. And I finally, I told her, cause it was gonna affect which college she should go to. Um, and I remember telling her, you know, I don't worry about that. Pick a college that has the, the right um, fit for you in terms of how you mm -hmm. learn best, right? because you're not gonna know what you wanna be when you grow up until maybe you're a junior or a senior. Yeah. And even then you might get it wrong. Probably get it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but the, the point is that um, it being educated is about learning how to learn and how to adapt to life's challenges. And so um, when we talk about college degrees and we talk, or we talk about other post-secondary types of um, opportunities for our students is like how do we how are we helping them to be successful in whatever they choose to pursue even if they're getting it wrong like can they recover can they find another pathway to take and will they continue to persevere and be able to raise a healthy family in a community that they so desire to live that in. issue of perseverance yeah. and learning from your mistakes mm -hmm. we were talking about that before how valuable that I've seen that is. I mean, is, are we talking about that, an atmosphere that lets kids make mistakes, yeah. fail? And fail and not, and not be punished for failing, mm -hmm. especially if they reflect on it and then grow. And learn from, from it. it. Learn from it, yeah, because yeah. that's what I think it, it will take them. You know, Dinter Smith it talks when he's here constantly about two schools in particular, mm -hmm. Keith Hayashi's mm -hmm. school. Like, uh, where, uh, yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. with multiple academies, students can mm -hmm. try different things, and Mid-Pacific, where they've got four tracks, whether you're arts or tech or standard textbook and test, I mean, you let kids find, as you say, their way of learning and their way of growing in an environment instead of saying, this is the way I did it when I went to school. And Parents have to give up a little of their fear. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and autonomy. And just to know that um, 
that the children are nurtured in what they're doing and when they move forward that they're going to you know be the sort of the masters of their own destinies and and choose what type of education suits them because the content I mean we can all take out our phones and we can Google all the content right. in the world exactly mm -hmm. and so um, how then do we provide those um, environments for them to just excel with the things that they're interested in the things that are of the future you know I'm gonna to go to kind of a lightning round here because we've got so many questions and they're good <laughs> questions um, and I, I get a sense from some of these questions of a discomfort with how amorphous the system looks like if we look to the future and how undirected things are you know like you know people are bringing up like well, how do we make sure that there's enough unmet need for you know uh, training elder care staff dog trainers uh, we need dog trainers are schools going to bring back technical classes like in the past shop home ec technical skills Another one, uh, you, you know, caller heard there's a shortage of seven million trades level workers nationally. Mm -hmm. What's being due to, you know, it kind of brings up a cart right. and a horse thing. We know that there's a need in the economy. We know that there are kids, sure. but then who's deciding which kids are going where? I think a that's a huge kind of looming teacher shortage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. Well, let's pay them a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> um, so any response to this 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 sense from the audience of well wait wait a minute you, you can't just walk away from all this kinds of education well i think the underlying in all of this is all the skills are great will the skills be what's necessary for success and and what phyllis said earlier is exactly right if you're developing skills and learning how to learn and mm -hmm. thinking critically i think that's what drives the persistence the discipline the values no matter what skill you, 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 you take on or what school of thought you come from, I think there's some underlining threads, common threads, and that's learning how to learn and being a constant learner and a lifelong learner. I think those are, those are the skills most You're necessary. talking about also being prepared for leaving school and having things change under you all the time. Right, right absolutely. Uh, we've been institutionalized most of our lives. and to how do we function outside of an institution? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do we function when mom and dad's not there? Mm -hmm. And that's that constant learning and adaption. Yeah. So let me um, throw out one more uh, interesting person to bring into this conversation. One of the first advocates for transforming our educational model for the 21st century was a fellow named Tony Wagner. He surveyed top corporate executives and business schools and wrote the book, The Global Achievement Gap, and cited seven skills students must develop. Critical thinking and problem solving collaboration across networks and leading by influence, agility and adaptability, initiative and entrepreneurship, effective oral and written communication, accessing and analyzing information, curiosity and imagination. And I look at this thing, my first thought was, there ain't no math in this. <laughs> and there's no history. It's like that's secondary to your ability to think. And you use you basically use math and history and science and art to right. develop those skills. Mm -hmm. And that list, John Dewey would have been very comfortable with yes. also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it hasn't really changed all that much in a hundred years in terms of what we want mm -hmm. people as, to have the skills like you're pointing out. It's, it, but it just looks different the way we're providing it. Right. Yeah. Because the content has changed so much, mm -hmm. you know, the content is readily available. It's not the stage on the stage holding on to the content anymore and delivering it in curriculum. This is something that, you know, it's, you have to be highly adaptive throughout our lives. I mean, you know, even as, uh, as an old man that I am right now, I'm still adapting to the new changes of technology, social media, um, trying to get my skills to the place where they'll be usable by others. And I think that our children and um, when you talked about you know the dog trainers and all of those <laughs> other um, necessary um, professions our children definitely have to have those skills if that's what they choose to do and this is all about choice this is all about a journey of education about being adaptive adaptable is about collaboration and partnerships so those things that uh, Tony Wagner talked about I mean that's right on I think right on the kini popo, right on the ball. Yeah. Absolutely, I think another vital, important ingredient to that is being able to understand how to access resources. 
-hmm. Not everybody comes from the same demographic, comes from That's the same right. cut, has the same experiences. How do our youth know wherever I am, wherever I started from, mm -hmm. how can I access the resources in order to get ahead? Right. Right. And going back to one of the questions about HOMAC and mm -hmm. uh, mechanics and so forth is um, the, you know, when we think about leveling up, right, from home ec, which was probably about can can you um, take care of a home, to now We're culinary arts. Wall, culinary arts, right? This idea of can you create with um, the food and um, can you can you uh, run a business, right? Can you can you serve others um, and and uh, pay attention to the needs of others and can you? Can you be this person that has hospitality? Right? Is that how it's now taught at DOE? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, and, and I, I'm not even doing it justice, right? Mm -hmm. But the idea is that um, whether that person, that 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 student or that learner becomes a chef or runs a business, those skills about hospitality, about creating and trying something new and creating something that nobody else has thought of before. Those are great skills and great opportunities that we should be giving every child, giving them access to it. So instead of pigeonhole kids into like, we want you to go into this career because that's what we think you're good at, mm -hmm. is instead of us telling them what they're mm -hmm. good at, let them discover what they're good at mm -hmm. and in fact explore what else they might want to learn about. And I think right. when we get to that point, yeah. we no longer are conditioning workforce and job skills. Mm -hmm. We're conditioning those that will create new industries mm -hmm. and they will create the next jobs and the new mm -hmm. industries for yeah. our future. It's not going to be done to them. It, they're going to be doing it. You're right. Yeah. 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 And that's when you change that pie graph with the economics mm -hmm. graph because when children actually um, get to develop and, and think about and innovate and create. That's the, the value that they bring to our new world economy. You know, uh, I got a couple of questions, and I don't think these are cynics, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> they are asking difficult questions, mm -hmm. you know, that have to do with economics and business sure. models that we're accustomed to. Mm -hmm. All of this takes money. Mm -hmm. It needs to come from somewhere Absolutely. that that brings up political choices. It brings up business choices for the the organization. So one caller um, brings up, and this is always a, a, a time bomb when it comes in, why aren't we empowering parents to choose how to best educate their children by allowing the money to follow the child? Sounds like a voucher mm -hmm. suggestion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what would that, what effect would that have? You know, given that we're talking about freedom of movement across all these platforms, you know, um, unless people have money to do that, they don't have freedom of movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think there's, there's also this idea of um, how do we, it, you know, not only the parents' choice, but what about the students' choice? Um, and then secondly is that this idea of um, how do we um, help students and, and, and families to um, engage with and uh, be a contributing member of their own community? Right. So I got so. two. I got two questions along those lines directed toward DOE. Can the panel speak? And everyone should participate with this one. Mm -hmm. To how homeless children are being supported? Are there resources and incentives to encourage participation for these families? And another, um, as educational leaders, do you feel, Kuliana, to address the wellness needs of generational poverty that is systemic in Hawaiian communities? How do you get there? So the, the answer is absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Well, yes, um, of course. And if you take a look in the Nanakuli Wainai area, um, cre creating comprehensive health um, types of services um, in the schools, um, you know, looking at how the schools are now setting up, knowing that our, um, the learners are coming with some challenges and how do we create um, a safety net for them that says when you come to school that these are some things that can happen for you um, that are, are going to impact your learning, right? So every school and ev every school has to model and design something that fits the needs of their students, right? Um, and it doesn't mean that they're all going to look the same, right? But first we have to know and understand our community and what the needs are in our community. And what's that design of the school that's going to address not only the needs of the student, but the aspirations of the students. You know, it's also about the partnerships that you're talking about, you know, the partnerships to work with generational poverty among Native Hawaiian 
and, and other uh, ethnic groups within Hawaii, you know, how we form those pa partnerships and work closely together with education, with social services, uh, medical services, because there's a wide um, variety of things. And also, you know, the funding has to be there too. So we have to um, get the funding from private sources, from public sources, um, from the legislature to make sure that we are addressing all the needs of um, people in all different places in Hawaii. And as I said earlier, when I believe that industry and higher ed will start to morph and look more like each other, I also think that in order to right these social ills, wraparound services and social, social, social services will start to inform and look mm -hmm. more like our mm -hmm. education system and be one with our education system. Because we, we said earlier, the platform for teachers moving towards coaches and mentors and counselors and therapists. Mm -hmm. We need these wraparound services for what's happening in our world today in order to best service our, our youth. You know, I'd like to throw this out. We've got about two minutes left. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of exciting concepts, you know, thrown out here. I'd like each of you just to pitch in with what you're most excited about in terms of education or the economy and the relationship of them. You know, what, what do you look most forward to over the next 10 or 15 years in terms of reforming the system? Phil Bossert from the independent schools. Oh, so, well, I think the diversity that I see in the 36 or 37 charter 36. schools, in the 96 private schools, and I think what Sione said is true about uh, the public schools too. I worked there for four years and used to think they're all alike, but they're not. Mm -hmm. And you, so I, I think the diversity that's in our schools with our teachers is going to help create that future. Uh, hello, Stender. You, you're going to get the last words. I think community engagement is absolutely necessary to look at on the context of each and every community um, and, and the things that they need. So how do we build our education system, our social uh, system, so that um, they are in it? Uh, for the, for what they need because every context is different. So the Waianae context is different from the Hilo context, from the Kapa con context. And I think that working with our communities and with our community leaders, that's the best way to sort of propel um, our success with education and with social welfare and uh, for the betterment of all the people of Hawaii. Yeah, it's been, very, it's been a lot, really fun conversation. I want to thank you all and also thank all of our viewers who have joined us tonight. And I've been told we want to book this Dave Guest panel for a follow-up show a year from tonight. So we'll go check it out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a special mahalo to Phyllis Unabasami from Hawaii's Department of Education, Holo Ua Stender from Kamehameha Schools, Philip Bossert from the Hawaii Association of Independent Schools, and Sienna Thompson with the State Public Charter School Commission. I'm Daryl Huff for PBS Hawaii. Ahui ho. Ahui ho.